good. So uh, everybody will come to this uh, Wednesday afternoon. And our speaker today is Kasia Reisner from University of York. And you can see the title. I'm not going to read the title. Please, Kasia. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to speak at the seminar. Um, yeah, so the, the title is a mouthful, but it's about asymmetries and dynamics in, uh, well, a relatively new approach to constructing uh, nets of sister algebras in the QFT. So this is based on, uh, well, uh, ongoing project with uh, Romeo Brunetti, Michel Dutch, and uh, Klaus Reinhagen. So I will report on the current state of the situation. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so let me start with maybe just um, summarizing what, what I want to tell you today. So uh, this talk is mainly based on the following paper, the unitary mass award identity, uh, time size axiom, the test theorem and anomalies. Uh, so this is the paper which appeared uh, on the archive relatively recently. Um, and uh, the idea I want to convey is that you can have things like interactions, renormalization, anomaly, symmetry, so all these things that people usually associate with perturbative QFT uh, in a framework which is entirely based on sister algebras, so uh, honest to goodness, a QFT. Um, and an important notion here is uh, the notion of causality, so we're going to uh, work in Lorentzian geometry. Uh, and um, let me just uh, tell you how, uh, well, for those of you who don't know algebraic quantum field theory, maybe there's a very small number. Uh, let me just uh, review very quickly uh, what are the basic axioms. Okay, so uh, we start with uh, Minkowski space stem and uh, well, uh, the idea of AQFT, of the axiomatic framework, going back to Hag and Kassler, is that we associate to regions of space-time algebras of observables that can be measured in these regions. And the notion of subsystems is encoded in the idea of isotony. So uh, we obtain a net of algebras. Um, and there are further uh, properties we require. Um, and the first one, important one, is the causality, which says that if we have two regions that are space like separated, so they cannot be joined by a causal curve, then the um, corresponding algebras have to commute. And another axiom, which I'm not going to talk about too much today, but it's uh, important bit of the paper is the time size axiom, which is a quantum version of um, Cauchy evolution of having well posed Cauchy problem. And um, it says that if we have a neighborhood of a Cauchy surface, uh, then the algebra that we associate to that neighborhood is isomorphic to the algebra of the whole region for which we have that Cauchy surface. So that's a uh, review of um, algebraic quantum field theory. And now we want to apply it also on curved space time. So we want to, um, well, mix in some effects of general relativity, but uh, in the situation where general relativity effects are small, so we don't have to do things like quantum gravity. And examples of where this is actually useful, well, um, early universe, uh, black hole radiation, so situations where people use QFT on curve space them. So the generalization of our framework is that we assign now to every globally hyperbolic space stem, so globally hyperbolic meaning it has a Cauchy surface, the algebra of observables for that space. Time. So instead of just looking at regions of a fixed uh, space time, we look at all the space times uh, at the same time. And then we also have embeddings of space times uh, and we assign to those also embeddings of algebras. And this has to be covariant in some way. And this covariance requirement is uh, encoded in requiring that uh, a is a factor. So, so we have some category of space stems 
of appropriate structure, we have some category of uh, algebras. So here we want to think sister algebras and A is a factor. So that's just to uh, fix the notation. So, so this is the kind of thing I will try to uh, construct uh, in this talk and tell you how to construct uh, such factors. So uh, let's start with uh, well, physical input. So uh, we take a space stem, which is globally hyperbolic. As I said, uh, we want a Cauchy problem to, to make sense. So in particular, we want Cauchy uh, self. Yeah. Sorry, is, is that a question? I mentioned to them as well that it's, I'm having a problem getting a book in that sounds great. Hello? OK. Um, I will carry on. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's uh, one piece of data. Uh, then if we want to specify uh, what sort of fields we want to study, so what kind of objects we want to consider, uh, then we also need to specify the configuration space. And typically, this will be a space of smooth sections of some vector bundle. And here are the examples that are, uh, well, often considered. So there is the scalar field. Um, for young mills theory, we would take uh, sections of um, some vector bundle. So if we just take um, the trivial uh, principal bundle uh, for the young mills theory, we would just have one forms valued in some of the algebra. And uh, well, we can even do things like effective quantum gravity uh, where uh, the appropriate uh, configuration space is um, the space of uh, two uh, tensors. Okay, um, but so, so these are physical examples of things that one could potentially uh, try to uh, describe. Uh, but regardless, I'm going to always use the notation five for an element of configuration space, whatever that is. And well, after setting up this, uh, let's call it um, kinematical structure, we need to also specify dynamics. And for that, I'm going to use a modification of the Lagrangian formalism. So um, in, in this approach, uh, Lagrangians are important. So uh, we are, well, uh, typically, you know, many of the rigorous approaches to quantization uh, favor Hamiltonian. Uh, in this approach, we actually think in terms of Lagrangians. And the advantage of doing that is we want to stay fully covariant, so we don't want to invoke the explicit foliation of our space-time into Cauchy surfaces, so don't want to split between space and time. Okay, uh, so how to construct such models? Uh, here is an idea. Um, this was proposed uh, also relatively recently in 2020 by uh, Detlef Buchholz and Klaus Rehenhagen, a uh, sister algebraic approach to interacting quantum field theories. Uh, so, so this was the beginning of that. And the main idea is that the model is described by an abstract sister algebra generated by a collection of unitaries with a number of relations. So this is very simple from you know, sister algebraic perspective. Um, and the physical motivation for those unitaries is uh, local S matrices. So in a sense, this story starts in uh, perturbation theory. So this approach, uh, one can say, is inspired by perturbative AQFT where one constructs these local S matrices perturbatively. But here we just want to think of them as some abstract unitaries with relations that are then um, inspired, uh, motivated by perturbation theory. Okay, uh, so let's start with uh, the setup. And here uh, at the beginning, there is a certain overlap between doing perturbative and non-perturbative stories. So um, in the classical uh, theory, we just uh, start with the space of classical observables, which are functions on the configuration space, and we want uh, them to be smooth. And because the notation is getting crowded, I'm going to drop M from the notation. So uh, we always think about uh, some fixed space time in the background. Um, if we want to assign observables to regions, we need to know about 
uh, support. So uh, here is the definition of a support of a functional. So uh, essentially the region of space time where the functional is sensitive to perturbations localized in that region. So this is uh, formalized here. And uh, an important class of uh, functionals is uh, the local ones. So a functional is local essentially if it can be expressed in terms of some smooth function on the jet bundle. So here is the formula. Uh, okay, so right, uh, we can make sense of all this because uh, we understand uh, infinite dimensional differential geometry pretty well. So one can um, to some extent forget that uh, the configuration space is infinite dimensionals and these functionals are uh, also, you know, functions on uh, infinite dimensional space. Um, so, you know, the, everything there is, is mathematically precise. One has to be a bit careful about specifying topologies and so on, but not going to get into details of that. Um, just uh, to fix the notation, because, you know, in physics and mathematics, people denote things very differently. So I'm, I'm typically writing the first derivative uh, like this. So this is the first derivative of a functional f at point phi in the direction of psi. In, in physics, one would uh, typically write it in this df over d phi of x notation. And this, this pairing here uh, between the derivative and direction psi uh, would be expressed as an integral. So uh, that's uh, typically the formal notation. Uh, and the definition of that very thing is, well, this is just a directional derivative. So the definition is quite clear. And if we have a local functional, then uh, one can do the computation, find out that well, uh, you can do some integration by parts. So if you use this presentation of a variational derivative, uh, then uh, you obtain something which looks like your honest to goodness Lagrange derivative in classical theory. So, so this is all very, very standard. Um, and now let's try to talk about the dynamics. So uh, normally in classical mechanics, we would just go ahead with Lagrangian density integrated over uh, the whole space, and that would be it. However, here we have to be careful because our um, manifold is non-compact. So we cannot just take the Lagrangian density and integrate it over the whole space time. Um, also, uh, there are other uh, deeper problems with this. Uh, so what we do is we take uh, functionals, we take um, something that, well, going forward will be interpreted as interactions with a cutoff. So we have a cutoff, which is a smooth, compactly supported function. And then we multiply our Lagrangian density with that cutoff and then integrate. So a Lagrangian is really a map here from cutoffs to local functionals. And, and here is a simple example of a free scalar field. Here is the example for Young Mills theory. And here is the example for uh, effective, uh, well, for gravity, so with the Ricci scalar. Um, also just a note that any local functional induces such generalized Lagrangian, so we can uh, define the generalized Lagrangian uh, as a function of cut of f and the field phi by multiplying the field phi by that cut of. And I'm just going to uh, not distinguish between uh, local functionals and induced generalized Lagrangians because it's very easy to, to go from one to the other. So instead of writing this LF as the induced Lagrangian, I will just write F in what follows. Okay, uh, so now let's uh, keep going with uh, the classical dynamics. So uh, I told you a bit about uh, variational derivative, but uh, well, before we uh, have the derivative, there is a sort of step in between. We can consider uh, just the variation, just um, 
well, the difference quotient defining the derivative. So we can look at uh, the shift of a functional, in this case, or Lagrangian with a given cutoff by some perturbation psi, and then compare it with the unshifted functional. So um, now, interesting thing is that for local interactions, if we now choose the cutoff to be one on the support of this perturbation psi, then uh, this, this map delta L, uh, which takes a size, takes a perturbation, takes a point and uh, well, spits out the number. This map does not depend on the particular choice of F of cutoff, as long as this cutoff is one on the support of the perturbation. So this is the way to get independent of uh, the cutoff. Uh, and then, well, from this, we can build the difference quotient and the Euler-Lagrange derivative. So uh, I will denote it by dL, so the differential of L, and this is defined as you might imagine. So uh, just take one over T of that difference quotient and take the limit. And again, that Euler-Lagrange derivative of L is independent of the choice of F we used to define it. And again, you can uh, convince yourself that uh, in practice, this gives you the, the usual uh, formula for variational derivative if you integrate by parts. Uh, so the field equation now is the condition dl of phi equals zero. Uh, so geometrically, the solution space is a zero locus of uh, this one form dl. Um, and uh, from now on, I'm going to consider uh, Lagrangians that lead to equations that are normally hyperbolic. So this is essentially wave equations uh, plus stuff. So uh, the principal symbol is going to be a principal symbol of the wave operator. Okay, so that's dynamics. Now symmetries. Uh, so how do I want to think about symmetries? Where infinitesimally, I can think of them as vector fields on the configuration space. And here I use a bit of a um, formal notation. So uh, in finite dimensions, you could uh, write uh, the um, directional derivative of a function along a vector field x uh, in terms of uh, well, the derivatives with respect to the coordinates. Um, in infinite dimensions, we have to be a bit more careful about that. But again, uh, people uh, often use a bit of formal notation. So uh, one can also think of these vector fields in sort of coordinate way uh, by writing things in this form. So what's a symmetry? So uh, very basically, symmetry is uh, a vector field now such that uh, the Lagrangian is uh, constant when uh, perturbed by that vector field. So uh, it corresponds, oh, sorry, there's a typo, it should be a Lagrangian. Uh, it corresponds to a direction in your configuration space where the Lagrangian is constant. Uh, so now Nutter's theorem uh, in classical, uh, mechanics would uh, tell us that, uh, well, in classical field theory, that if we have symmetries, uh, then that leads to conserved currents, conserved charges, and these are useful things uh, also in quantization. So um, it's a very beautiful result connecting uh, symmetries to conservation laws. Uh, and one of the motivations of the current work uh, is, was to uh, understand what's the quantum version of that result. So what's the proper way of understanding quantum symmetries? And, and this is hopefully what I'm going to uh, show you in what follows. So uh, let's start now with the construction of the actual model. So I told you about uh, space times, I told you about uh, Lagrangians. Uh, in our construction, we are going to consider something 
we call dynamical space stamps. So we will consider a pair of a space stamp and what we can think of as a background Lagrangian. So um, this is non-perturbative. So the, the sort of background Lagrangian is not necessarily a quadratic, um, but um, well, we want it to be uh, nice in a certain way. So the kinetic term um, should look like something that gives normally hyperbolic equations with respect to uh, some globally hyperbolic metric. So that's uh, the only restriction. So it cannot, we don't want this background Lagrangian um, to have uh, higher derivatives than uh, second derivative of the field. And then we want the principal symbol of induced equations to look good. Okay, and then we consider interactions which are uh, possible for that choice of background Lagrangian and which don't spoil our uh, normal, normally hyperbolic equations. So, um, but that leaves a lot of freedom actually, right? So we can take all sorts of polynomial interactions um, and things that uh, contain first derivative of the field. Uh, and these, uh, first of all, we can think of them as local functionals and then uh, these induce Lagrangians and we call those interactions. So uh, local functionals that uh, don't spoil uh, the hyperbolicity of um, the equations um, are going to be ad admissible interactions for a given dynamical spacetime ML. Okay, oops. Um, okay, so again, as I said, we can think of them as perturbations of L, but um, these are sort of like finite <laughs> perturbations. So um, the uh, framework is not going to rely on, on, on these perturbations being small in any sense. Okay, right. So that's halfway through the talk. So uh, finally come to uh, defining uh, what's our uh, net of Systra algebras. And as I said, this is very, very simple. Um, so we just, uh, for each dynamical space time, so a pair of global, globally hyperbolic space time plus background Lagrangian, I consider uh, Systra algebras generated by unitaries, which are labeled by those local interactions with uh, appropriate normalization. Um, and the following relations. And it, because, well, carrying those subscripts is a bit of a nuisance, I'm going to drop them in the notation as follows. So, uh, but you have to remember that everything is kind of associated to a given dynamical space time. So the first axiom, which guarantees, uh, the first relation we want to portion out, which guarantees causality in the resulting net is um, this factorization property. So if we have two, uh, well, we have three perturbations, three interactions, and two of them have pairwise disjoint support. So F and H have disjoint support. And moreover, um, H comes before G, okay? So we have, you know, time direction, causal structure, we can make sense out of that. So if this is the case, then uh, the S matrix should factorize as follows. So this is one of the relations we want. And another relation, which is um, sort of dynamical relation, which implements uh, part of the dynamics uh, in the quantum theory, uh, has something to do with this shift. So uh, I defined uh, the shift of the Lagrangian and uh, well, we can also take a shift for any observables. Um, and it turns out that uh, the appropriate dynamical, finite dynamical relations to, to ask for um, our S matrix for our unitaries uh, is this one. So we have some um, action of uh, this group of translations by uh, Psi, by a compactly supported configuration. And uh, surprisingly, it's not just taking a shift of uh, a given uh, perturbation of a given interaction, but also there is this bit with the shift of the background Lagrangian. Um, 
it turns out that this particular relation, uh, if we look at its infinitesimal form, as I'm going to say in a minute, um, leads to something called Schwinger Dyson equation. So you can think of this dynamical relation as uh, a finite uh, unitary form of the Schwinger Dyson equation. Okay, so, uh, and, and for, for now that's it, we have these two relations. Uh, and let me try to explain why uh, these make sense, why we consider those particular relations. And so, so here is the motivation from perturbative AQFT. Uh, so let's consider the situation where L0 is a quadratic Lagrangian with some normally hyperbolic equations. Uh, we know that in such uh, situations, we have retarded and advanced green functions, the commutator function, um, and so on. Um, we can also add, uh, well, to this commutator function, a symmetric bit and obtain uh, what then becomes the two-point function uh, of the quantized theory. So this is all very standard. Um, in Minkowski space term, well, this would be the Whiteman two-point function on Kepp space term. This would be a two-point function of some Hadamard state for the free theory. Um, so we can do all that magic. And we can also introduce the Feynman propagator, which is, uh, again, a combination of all these objects. So uh, retarded plus advanced uh, green function plus this extra bit H. So, I'm just going to care about the Feynman propagator for now. So let's just retain that. Um, and using that, we can define something called time-ordered product. So given local uh, interactions, we take an operation, which is, uh, well, differentiating with respect to the field and contracting with the Feynman propagator with appropriate combinatorics. And this defines n-fold time ordered product Tn. Okay, and uh, a priori, this is defined for things with um, pairwise disjoint supports, but we can also extend this to arguments with arbitrary supports, and this is uh, what has been done in the 60s, 60s, 70s uh, by Epstein and Glaser. So um, this is, the, the essence of epstein glaser renormalization. So to try to make sense of these time ordered products for arbitrary local functions. And again, this is well known in perturbation theory. Uh, people are uh, comfortable with that uh, in perturbation theory. And the way one constructs those TNs is by some kind of inductive procedure in N um, and one requires some axioms for these TNs to be satisfied. On the technical uh, level, this amounts to construction of extensions of certain distributions. So this is some functional analytic side to it. Now, one of these axioms that one asks is called causal factorization property. So um, if we have a bunch of those um, interactions that come later than, than another group, then the time ordered product factorizes. So this particular relation actually would then lead to, uh, well, it's, it's part of the motivation for one of the properties I uh, mentioned in this dynamical sister algebra. So let's see how it happens. Um, so yeah, so we have this family of TNs. So epstein glaser happened. Uh, we can then uh, use those to define the S matrix, which is then a sort of time ordered exponential. So it's defined uh, as this uh, Laurent series in H bar. And now this causal factorization property for TNs implies the factorization property for uh, the formal S matrix. And, and this is exactly, you see the property we are asking uh, in this abstract Sistra algebra. We are uh, requiring that the unitaries that are interpreted as, as those as matrices satisfy such properties. So it's a very well motivated. It's essentially 
the reflection of causality in our framework. Okay, uh, there is more uh, stuff about time modded products that actually becomes uh, relevant. So uh, one can also uh, put these things together and uh, use a sort of inverse of multiplication for multi-local functionals. So one can factorize products of local functionals back into local functionals and define uh, a map on multi-local functionals, uh, which, well, uh, I will call here the time ordering map. And uh, if you want to make a connection between well, our uh, framework and uh, you know, traditional quantum field theory of path integral, well, you can think of applying this map T as the path integral with the oscillating Gaussian measure with covariance uh, given by the Feynman propagator. Of course, this is not entirely precise. Um, th the right-hand side uh, doesn't really make sense in Lorentzian signature. Uh, so you can think of uh, you know, defining these time ordered products and this map T as a way actually to make sense out of the right-hand side by just keeping the combinatorics, keeping the basic properties, but avoiding uh, talking about an actual path integral. So it has all the good features, but uh, less of the bad features. Uh, so one can also define an honest to goodness uh, binary product using this, which is then uh, equivalent to just a pointwise product of functionals. And then you can think about the S matrix as the time ordered exponential. So everything uh, here is motivated by this idea of time ordered exponentials. Okay. Um, and well, I should probably also say, why is it time ordered? Um, so we have a, a star product, which is uh, given by the two point function, which is giving you appropriate commutation relations. And the time ordered product is essentially the time ordered version of that. So uh, F time ordered G is F star G if the support of F comes later and G star F if the support of G comes later. So that's the sort of motivation behind uh, that name. Okay, and uh, let me just finish this uh, motivation um, with um, talking about renormalization group because this is what comes next also in uh, the non, non perturbative framework. Uh, so in Epstein Glaser, one can construct those TNs, but they happen not to be uh, unique. And the non uniqueness, the freedom you have in extending those TNs to um, arguments with coinciding support is governed by the Stuckerberg Peterman renormalization group. And uh, again, in perturbation theory, this is a map from a uh, formal power series in a flock to formal power series and satisfying some extra conditions, which I'm not going to list because I want to talk about their non-perturbative version. So that would be a bit repetitive. Um, so, so there is this group, so it acts on local functionals. Uh, and then the main theorem of renormalization says that this exactly um, describes the renormalization freedom. So if we have uh, two prescriptions for time ordering for time ordered products, T and T uh, tilde, then the relation between the corresponding uh, time ordered exponentials can be encoded in applying an element of this renormalization group to your interaction. So, uh, and this is if and only if, uh, so each element of this randomization group gives you another time ordering prescription and any other time ordering prescription has to be related by such element of the randomization group. And intuitively, if you want to connect this to traditional QFT, you can think of Z as adding finite counter terms or changing values of the coupling constants. All right, so uh, that's, the perturbative story that again has been known since Epstein Glaser and Stuckerberg Peterman. Uh, but now we want to use 
similar concepts, but in the situation where we have uh, that Caesar algebra generated by unitaries labeled by local functionals. So we do have local functionals. So, so that's, that's, that's good. Um, so now, again, we define uh, what's non-perturbative uh, randomization group in the sister algebraic framework. Um, we define it again axiomatically. So um, for a given um, dynamical spacetime ML, uh, we define this uh, renormalization group as a set of uh, bijections of this space of local functionals. So again, uh, in the first instance, renormalization group is, is uh, the well, subgroup of, of the bijections of local functionals. So uh, maps local to local, uh, which satisfy the following conditions. So here are some uh, properties that we want to require. Um, first is that the support of Z should be compact. Okay, we don't want to leave the realm of compact support. Uh, and a, a stronger uh, requirement uh, invariance of support. So Z should actually preserve the support of functionals in appropriate sense. And it should preserve uh, this uh, causality or locality. Um, feature. So if we want uh, S matrices to satisfy uh, causal factorization property, so then th these elements of randomization group uh, should also reflect some of these properties. So locality, or in other words, causality uh, has to be also implemented. And here is uh, the implementation. So if you have Again, F and H, which are in some sense uh, with disjoint supports, then the element of the randomization group when applied to this combination F plus G plus H has to split in these three terms. So it's a very similar in structure to what we have for um, the S matrices. Okay, uh, another uh, requirement that has to preserve the dynamics uh, and it preserves the dynamics in the sense of uh, preserving the structure of a shift by an element of uh, the space of compactly supported configurations. Um, there is a slightly uh, more technical assumption about the behavior under uh, the field uh, shift. So it's related to the dynamics, but not quite. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's maybe not, not so easy to uh, guess this, but uh, in the case where we are looking at local, uh, sorry, at a quadratic uh, background functional, this property would say that uh, Z of F shifted by Psi is just Z of F, all of it shifted by Psi. So, so this, is, this is clear, this is known. Uh, the quadratic case, uh, the version for non-quadratic L is, is a bit, it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, we checked it works. Um, and finally, we want Z to uh, preserve causal structure because again, uh, we are in the situation where uh, we consider uh, changes to uh, the interaction that might potentially uh, change the metric uh, for the global, uh, global, globally hyperbolic metric and um, the normally hyperbolic equations we have. So we always want to um, look at dynamics, which is hyperbolic, but the dynamics can change upon um, applying Z. But, but we, we, don't, we don't want the causal structure to, to change after applying Z to an interaction. Um, so that is it in terms of uh, properties. Um, so yeah, so just to summarize uh, this structure, so we have uh, our dynamical sister algebra generated by S matrices labeled by functionals. 
we have uh, the randomization group, which is a certain a subgroup of, of bijections of local functionals. And then uh, the final step, we want to see how symmetries fit into this story. Um, I should have said that it probably <laughs> didn't, so I apologize for that. Uh, for, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to look at um, the situation where the configuration space is just um, and uh, scalar fields. So uh, if I had the blackboard, I could just write it. Uh, so maybe let me write it on the margin. So E of M is just smooth maps from M to Rn. So for simplicity, we are going to consider just N scalar fields. And now the symmetry transformations in that story are uh, well given by this semi-direct product. So we have um, affine field redefinition. So so we can um, you know just uh, apply affine transformations to these components and move them around. And we have also compactly supported the form of of M that can also shift uh, things around. Um, so this is the group of symmetries I want to uh, consider. And uh, well, here, uh, just for completeness, uh, is uh, the product of two uh, such symmetries. So phi belongs to affine field redefinitions, and chi belongs to deform morphisms. If I want to compose them, then I have to is this semi-direct product rule. Um, I should remove these annotations. <sighs> right. Uh, splendid. Uh, and I can also speak of support of such uh, a transformation. So this is going to be the union of supports of this affine field redefinition and the and, uh, uh, compactly supported DFO. And obviously, these act on fields. So these act on uh, these uh, n scalar fields. Uh, and hence, you can define the action on functionals by pullback. So uh, this is, well, there's a question of in which order you do it, but uh, this is the order. So first, chi and then phi. Um, so so that, that, uh, that is the obvious action on local functionals, but one can also introduce a less obvious action, uh, which takes this pullback plus uh, the shift of the Lagrangian. So this is a, an action which depends on uh, the background Lagrangian. Okay, and so, with this in mind, so we have the renormalization group, we have the sister algebra, we have the symmetries, this very simple model. Uh, I'm finally ready to uh, formulate the mass of what identity, the anomalous mass of what identity, and say something about anomalies. So uh, again, let me start with perturbation theory. The mass of what identity in perturbation theory uh, well, essentially, it's not just one identity, it's uh, some um, hierarchy of identities uh, that guarantee that in the renormalized theory, classical symmetries remain unbroken. Okay, uh, so here I want to formulate something similar, but uh, in terms of this non perturbative renormalization group. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to say, what does it mean for a symmetry to be broken? So um, there's going to be uh, some notion of an anomaly. Uh, so let me first introduce uh, a class of maps that are going to be relevant. Um, so I claim that possible deviations from master world identity can be described in terms of maps going from the group of symmetries to the renormalization group. So this is a map 
of two groups. Uh, obvious condition for the identity, so it preserves the identity, uh, preserves the support, and satisfies the following co-cycle condition. So uh, again, this co-cycle condition is um, motivated by what one has in perturbation theory. Um, and uh, let's consider the set of all such co-cycles. So now the anomalous master word identity uh, is going to be the third axiom that we want to impose. So let, uh, again, ML be some dynamical space-time, so a globally hyperbolic space-time plus uh, some background Lagrangian. And now we say that the representation of our sister algebra of ML satisfies anomalous was anomalous mass was identity if there exists um, a co-cycle uh, zeta in this sense, uh, such that in that representation, uh, the transformation of that S matrix by the symmetry GL can be uh, absorbed as uh, a renormalization group um, element as composition with a randomization group element given by this co-cycle. So now I can also say, what does it mean for a symmetry to be preserved? So a classical symmetry is preserved if that co-cycle is just the identity. So if I didn't have zeta here on, on the right, um, if I had just identity, I would say that the S matrix is invariant under that symmetry transformation uh, in the representation pi. So in a sense, my classical symmetry remains a quantum symmetry. And here, uh, in general, this quantum symmetry is broken, but it's not broken too much. So this is controlled by this co-cycle. OK, so that's the new ingredient. Um, and now I can build it into uh, my sister algebra so I can consider the intersection of all the ideals annihilated by representations which satisfy this anomalous mass of what identity for a specific co-cycle zeta, and then denoted by A of ML zeta, the quotient of my dynamical algebra by that idea. So uh, A of ML zeta has now three pieces of data, so uh, dynamical space, then background Lagrangian, and the choice of a co-cycle. So this is then generated by unitaries uh, modulo uh, this ideal. And uh, well, there is a special case of this anomalous master word identity for uh, the um, zero uh, Lagrange, uh, sorry, for the um, zero perturbation. So if f is zero, uh, then we get the following uh, identity. So, uh, well, the transformation uh, on the left-hand side uh, can be thought of as uh, the symmetry transformation of the background Lagrangian. Um, and on the right-hand side, uh, we have uh, some remnant from the renormalization group. And this, uh, this object uh, on the right-hand side actually has an interpretation in perturbation theory. So if L is a quadratic Lagrangian, then uh, morally speaking, this uh, corresponds to uh, transformation, symmetry transformation of the Gaussian measure induced by that quadratic Lagrangian. So what pops up on the right-hand side uh, is in the path integral, if you apply the symmetry transformation to uh, your Gaussian measure, what could happen would be, uh, well, potentially, uh, you could pick up a Jacobian term for that symmetry transformation. So this uh, co-cycle evaluated at zero uh, is, morally speaking, uh, the logarithm of the Jacobian corresponding to that symmetry transformation. So. In perturbation theory, uh, well, you can either you know, compute it in, in the path integral way, 
or the infinitesimal version of that is something known as the Villa Plasian. So this framework connects nicely to my previous work uh, with Klaus Frenhagen from 2013, where we looked at the BV formalism. So uh, morally speaking, we are going towards something which can be thought of as the finite version of uh, that story. Okay, uh, well, the time is running out. Uh, I want to leave you some time for question. Uh, so let me just uh, go quickly to state the unitary Nutter theorem. Um, so let's first consider symmetries that, uh, well, are symmetries of, of the Lagrangian. So things that leave the Lagrangian um, unchanged. Um, and uh, so, okay, I'll maybe skip to that. Uh, and in particular, we can also uh, look at the group of symmetries, which I would call unbroken. So these are symmetries which, uh, for which the co-cycle uh, doesn't uh, change under the action of uh, well, uh, the symmetry group. And uh, among those, you can uh, consider those where this co-cycle can be locally trivialized. So maybe I should just go back to um, this identity. So you can consider the symmetries such that on the right-hand side, you would just have identity. Okay, and for such guys, and this is the final statement I want to make, um, for such guys, uh, the symmetry transformation, so this is what here is denoted by gamma H of the S matrix, can be unitary implemented by a unitary, which uh, then has an interpretation as the exponential of the conserved charge. So the there is a version of Nitter's theorem in this framework, which uh, guarantees the unitary implementation of unbroken symmetries. Now, what's more uh, surprising, and well, it requires a bit more explanation, maybe another hour of, of a talk, um, that also the symmetries that are broken are unitary implemented, although uh, the uh, unitaries are a bit different. So they don't uh, correspond on the nose to conserve charges. One needs to take the renormalization uh, transformation into account. But there is also an anomalous version of Nutter's theorem. Okay, um, I think that's it then. Um, thank you for your attention and uh, yeah, hope uh, you have some questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I'll stop the recording and uh, please go ahead with questions, if any. <laughs>